from the frost-tipped shores of the North Saskatchewan River right here in scenic Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. This is your host, Scott Roos of Down to the River Radio Show. And today on the line with me, very special guest indeed, Sonny Ozell, singer, songwriter extraordinaire. How are you doing today? I am well. I'm, I'm down in sunny Southern California in Los Angeles, wearing my sweatpants. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, all of us were kind of in that in that similar uh, situation, right? I mean, we're, you know, hunkered down uh, in, in any way we possibly can, basically walking around in comfy clothes for as long as it takes, I suppose. It, yep, that, that is exactly what we got to do for the human family, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, now, you know... One thing that, you know, I, I at least hope that a lot of us have been doing, though, is, you know, spending time listening to all the great music that has uh, come out in the re last, uh, you know, few months. And, of course, uh, your record, Overnight Lows, released February 28th. Uh, you know, first first of all, I got to hand it to you because, I mean, this is a fantastic record. It Ten tracks start to finish is an enjoyable listen. So uh, my, my hat is definitely off to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, from what I understand, uh, this record's been a while in coming, right? Because, I mean, I've sort of been reading different press releases and things. Um, you released a record in 2015, and then maybe since about 2016, 2017, there's kind of been a bit of a buzz around the release of this. Uh, I, I guess my first question is, uh, you know, just in, in terms of, like, you know, how long it took to shape and release a record, I mean, I, I'm assuming maybe life got in the way a little bit? It did, yeah. <laughs> and it's you know, I, I am, uh, until just recently, I've spent a lot of time on airplanes. Um, I spend a fair amount of time in the United Kingdom. Right. And so I've got some, some folks that I work with there. I've got some folks I work with in New York. And now I'm spending quite a bit more time in Los Angeles. So it's been a, uh, an exercise in scheduling multiple different uh, locales and human beings and <laughs> all of that, but um, yeah, the 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 writing process was, you know, fits and starts, and it the the instrumental aspects of the record came together really quickly, and then I kind of got to work on melody and lyrics, and sometimes it, a tune would come to me in a single night, and sometimes it took a you know a couple weeks to shape, but. All in all, I, the finished product feels contiguous to me and bookended, and, and that's uh, really what I was going for, and I'm satisfied that I got there eventually. Right, right. Well, now I think what happened was you rented, you had a rental house in L.A., and you literally flew your band from New York to L.A. just for kind of an initial... Um, you know, meeting, and I think you maybe even hammered out some of the backing tracks at that time, too. Is that right? Yeah, but that was where the the majority of the initial writing happened, and um, it was a lot of fun. We 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 all lived in the in the house together. We we moved all the living room furniture out of the living room and and set the band up in the living room. And we we took pool breaks and we took barbecue breaks and we took beer breaks. And um, <laughs> but you know we we listened to music together. We cooked together. It was very. Um, familial and uh, really lovely. So, I mean, are these scratch tracks that you laid down or was this like the actual uh, backing tracks that you used? I, I just, you know, if you could expand on the process a little bit. Definitely just scratch tracks that, that served as kind of demos that, that then got edited and then, and then we did some more demos and, um, and then actually I, I pretty much recorded this record twice. I, I got it to a place uh, in with my New York guys, and it just didn't it didn't feel like these tunes lived together. They 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 didn't I don't know they didn't talk to each other right, and so I ended up more or less starting over in Los Angeles with a wonderful engineer named Mike Piersante, right. who ha has been T Bone Burnett's engineer and mixing engineer for 20 years and and um lo and behold all the sounds were what i was finally you know what i'd been hearing and not getting basically it's such a smooth uh set of tracks i mean you can definitely hear the soul and, and jazz influences uh, i mean how much say did you have in in the instrumentation and the arrangements themselves during those initial scratch sessions 
Oh, I was, I was there for all of it. Um, and you know, as the, as the boss lady, um, you know, I, I say, I like this. I don't like that. No, that's not going the right way. Uh, let, why don't we try something like this? Um, so yeah, very much at my direction. Now, from a lyrics standpoint, were the lyrics written after you came up with the melodies in those initial sessions or, or before? Like, you know, how, how did that work for yeah, you? Yeah, it kind of, it, it, one sometimes comes before the other, but often it's the melody first, then uh, almost like a game of, of kind of Tetris or, or a puzzle, you you overlay lyrics and and also you know if the tune has a kind of i don't know melancholy feel then that might dictate what the lyrical content is versus you know if it has a more upbeat maybe driving down the road kind of vibe sure. uh, that's a different narrative so you know it it all kind of informs the other yeah, well, now I know, uh, you know, speaking of a driving kind of a vibe, I mean, you know, one of the singles you released was a track called Driving Highways. Now, am, am I detecting maybe a bit of a Eva Cassidy vibe? I mean, is that a singer that's been on your radar over the years? No, I don't know who that is. Oh, wow. <laughs> is, Snake is she Eyes. current or? Well, no, I mean, she's a, she's a singer-songwriter that passed away a number of years ago, but um, she kind of came back into the collective consciousness because uh, there was an American Idol contestant named Crystal Bowersox who uh, sang a song that Eva was really known for. Uh, a track called People, huh. People Get Ready, kind of a, a you know, a gospel-y kind of, a, you know, soul-infused vibe. And I mean, I was just curious as to whether, you know, like your influences and whether Eva had ever been somebody that you had uh, actually checked out. Obviously not. Oh, my gosh. Well, I will now. I've, I've never heard of her, but but I, I, I will now. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was thinking now, like, the track People Get Ready, at least the way Eva sings it, it really reminded me of Driving Highways. I, I mean, I guess that would, you know, sort of segue in, into, you know, an influences type thing because I think, you know, at a really young age, your your parents, uh, you know, had you exploring, uh, you know, music in its various forms. And I, I think you're also formally trained from a classical perspective. Am I right? Yes, yes. I, um... I started studying classical violin at the ripe age of four. Wow. And uh, classical vocal training from about 11 years old on. And um, I did both of those things until about 18, 19, when I decided I wanted to be a blues singer. And, um, you know, I, I went pretty headlong into that for a while. And then I joined a... Uh, a large kind of Afro-Cuban funk band in college because, you know, it was 1998 and that's right. what was cool, yeah. you know, like um, that Santana record, Supernatural, you know, that was so huge and that's the kind of music I was making. And, uh, and then I moved to New York shortly, yeah, it was probably around 2004 and, um, kind of focus more on jazz for a while and slowly but surely here I am. <laughs> so I've kind of done a little bit of everything, I guess, is the, is the short answer. Yeah. Now, you know, of course, Canada, you know, everything is so spread apart and, you know, what would be a, a city in Canada? Like for instance, I'm in a city of like 40,000 people. I mean, the, the thought of, going to the Big Apple and trying to hammer out some sort of career in the arts seems uh, phenomenally intimidating. I, I mean, you know... It was. It really, really was. <laughs> you're, you're, not, you're not wrong about that. Um, I, I, I think back to myself at that time and, I, you know, all things being equal, I couldn't do that now. I, I uh, The blind courage I had kind of blows me away <laughs> so I don't know maybe I should think about that more often when I have self-doubt it's like girl you you packed up a U-Haul and drove from Reno Nevada on Interstate 80 straight to the Lincoln Tunnel and yeah 
Yeah. Figured out how to live in New York City. Even the Crazy. thought of just driving <laughs> into the Big Apple from, from, you know, because I mean, I've, I've been on a couple of those big inter, interstate highways and it's just like, whoa, like everybody's just, you know, every single lane is full. Everybody's just, you know, four on the floor. It's like, what? Like, how do I even merge? Yeah. You know, like I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just showing how like small town I am now, but. It's, I, well, you know, I'm from Reno, Nevada, which it's a decent decently sized little town. I think it's maybe 300,000 people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, New York city's 8 million people and like, it's crazy. And it's, it's so densely populated, but that's also what's so beautiful about it. You know, I, um, I, my, the apartment that I lived in the longest for about seven years, I was, friends with my laundromat people. I was friends with my wine shop. I was friends with my, um, my UPS store and my pharmacist, you know, it's like, it's truly kind of a, a village mentality that, that New York city has. That's, I don't know. I haven't really experienced anything like it anywhere else. You, you know, like I've, I've been to New York myself and it's amazing when you, you know, as, as you get closer and closer to that Broadway area which i realize is phenomenally touristy but i mean it just seems like everybody that's working in that area isn't somehow involved in the arts i mean maybe that's a, a stereotype but i mean i was at the bubba gump shrimp restaurant you know just doing touristy things and <laughs> I, I happened to mention to this server like you know hey i'm in radio and the guy was like radio really i my friend and i just finished a film and then he was like <laughs> try, you know trying trying to get me to interview him and all kinds of stuff and now I, I think you you have a similar experience right i mean you know you were a, a server in a restaurant to get by yourself i did like Man, a tour of duty of restaurants. I I, uh, I had a list at some point of all the places I worked. I should try and work that up again before I forget. <laughs> right. But yeah, I worked in a lot of restaurants, and you know, I um, it's good work. It's it's honest work. I was very very good at it. I really enjoyed it. I made friendships that I'll have for the rest of my life. Um, and I learned a lot about food and wine and, you know, God willing, I'll be enjoying food and wine until the day I die. So <laughs> right. it, it was a great education in a lot of things that may not translate into other, you know, you, you put, Hey, I was, a, I was a waiter for 12 years on a resume and most folks will be like, Oh, okay. What, what kind of other job skills do you have? But I I am a highly skilled individual. It's just kind of hard to uh, explain that to maybe like an office manager or, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's similar for you doing the work that you do. You, you've got a lot of skills, but how to bring those to bear in like a sales environment, who right. knows? But yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm just thinking now too, like, uh, you know, go, going back to those initial days in New York City, I mean, you know, how, how did you break in? Like, it, are we talking like open mic nights here too? Because, you know, I've I've heard about all the, you know, the pay to play type scenarios that happen in New York. I mean, obviously you, you came up through the ranks and were able to uh, become reasonably successful. Yes, I was fortunate enough to have some friends a lot of the folks that I worked with when I was at college in um in Boulder Colorado a lot of those musicians kind of relocated to New York City so I had I had a network there right um, who you know so they could say oh man you got to go to Monday nights at, at you know the living room or you got to go to Wednesday nights at New Blue and so any night I wasn't working, honestly, I was going out and hearing music. And it's a funny thing, you know, in those time, in those years where I wasn't really singing out myself much, but I was going to hear a lot of music. I was kind of beating myself up and feeling like, oh man, I'm not, I'm not performing and I'm not getting out there enough. But now looking back, I realize that was just as important as performing. I was I was in like the listening phase, you know, and the, the phase of soaking stuff up and getting a feel for what I was really into and really kind of distilling what my own wishes and desires were for my own craft. 
And man, I look back on that time now and it, it has a very rosy glow. <laughs> as as it should uh, uh you know uh definitely man i mean you know such a a step of faith but uh like i said obviously it worked out for you i mean now of course you know just circling back to uh the album um your m most recent single has dropped in the last couple of weeks uh all that i am uh of course uh you know al although the record as a whole is cohesive this this has a you know a distinct kind of bouncy swagger and almost uh you know soul kind of vibe to it and and it's it's very hook infused uh, i mean what what can you tell us uh, uh about the song and you know how how you went about writing it and and the arranging and stuff i realize it's a giant blanket question but uh... sure sure um it's it's a hit tune i'm really proud of that one and i as it came together, it, it had the makings of something anthemic, you know? So this is a, a great example of, of a, a moment where I have, you know, I had been writing, I kind of am always writing snippets of lyrics, you know, words that I like the sound of next to each other. And I, I keep, I keep them in, an, um, in the notes folder on my phone. Right. And then, at some point, I copied and pasted all of this material uh, into a Word doc, and then I printed it all up, and I have these reams of paper, and then I just kind of went through and edited and clipped and, you know, would, would save things and pair things up, and and sometimes maybe it was just one line that would inspire the rest of the tune. And sometimes it was, you know, multiple verses that went into um, went into a, an already written instrumental situation. Right. But all that I am was very much kind of an ode to uh, to women and to to finding, you know, resiliency in obviously some very strange times and. Uh, and celebrating that. Yeah, for sure. And of course, in the video, you are, I, I guess for lack of a better word, you're, you're sort of like working with a horse and you're in a stable training a horse. I mean, I guess there's a bit of a metaphorical uh, aspect to that. Totally, totally. Um, it's kind of almost like a psychoanalytic thing of, you know, when you have a dream, they say that even the other people in the dream are aspects of your own selfhood and you know, you, you can only really ever know yourself. And um, so the horse is almost kind of these various aspects of my subconscious that I'm trying to both, you know, train, but also collaborate with and live in harmony with. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a great video, uh, you know, vi visually uh, stunning, uh, a very interesting watch. And of course, at the end, you end up kind of, you know, I guess for lack of a better word, you know, uh, you know, taming that horse, so to speak, uh, you know, so uh, all around, like I said, uh, you know, very enjoyable. So uh, again, my hat's off to you. Thank you. I'm um, proud of it. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's the, the director really... This woman, Alyssa Torvin, had just a brilliant concept and then executed it so well. And it, it was a, it was, we did it in, it was a night shoot and we, it was cold. Um, they actually, <laughs> they actually had to do a little bit of post-production color correction because there's a couple scenes in the video where my cheeks and my nose were just bright red from being so cold. Oh my. Um, although I will, I will acknowledge that, you know, in Southern California, we don't know from cold compared <laughs> to Saskatchewan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So apologies. Uh, yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, I used to live up in, in Yellowknife. I don't know if you're ever familiar with that show, Ice Road Truckers, but, uh, you know, you don't know cold until you've experienced, you know, minus 40 degree uh, temperatures. So, Ooh, let me tell no, you. thanks. No, 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 no. Mm -mm. Well, now... <laughs> 
That's is, wild. Yeah, yeah, I know. I don't know how I did it for as long as I did. And then, you know, I, I moved, uh, you know, south just in the last couple of years. And uh, it feels a lot warmer, even though people are saying, oh, it's so cold right now. And I'm like, why are you wearing a parka? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Sonny, it's been great chatting with you. I mean, I guess, you know, I, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot obviously going on in the world right now with COVID-19. So, I mean, I, I guess the operative question would be, you know, uh, what are you up to in the near future? And, and then uh, also uh, the distant future as well. I mean, you know, is there a hint as to uh, what the next single is going to be and so on and so forth? Yes, well, um, you know, like like everybody we're all trying to figure out, okay, what I had, I had all these plans, right. I, I had some festivals. I had a little tour. That's not happening. No. So how do I pivot and be adaptable? And the good news is that I've got some more, um, you know, some stuff to share online. And so I guess really that's kind of what I'm going to be doing is sharing another video and sharing some acoustic tracks and um, just, you know, reaching out to fans that way, I guess. And, and we're all in this together, and we'll see where this where this leads. Yeah, yeah. Our, <laughs> but our, stay healthy up there. Yeah, our premier the other day, uh, I don't know if he coined this phrase or not, but he, he uh, referred to uh, a lot of the closures and things going on as the social distancing economy, which I thought was uh, an interesting turn of phrase because, I mean, that's what we're experiencing right now is that social distancing economy. And I would imagine for an artist such as yourself, there there's probably a bit, a bit of a struggle to uh, just remain in, in the public eye. But, I mean, at least, you know, compared to 100 years ago when we had a Spanish the Spanish flu outbreak, of course, uh, there, there's a lot of avenues that can be explored online. So, uh, you know, that, that totally, that's good. Yeah. And, yeah, for sure. No, I'm 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 just I I'm feeling I'm leaning into gratitude. You know, it's it's I want to stay healthy and all my loved ones to stay healthy and get through this and see what's on the other side. Right on, Sonny. Well, listen, it's been uh, great chatting with you. Uh, I'll just plug the record one you more too. time. It's called Overnight Lows. was released February 28th, and it is a brilliant record start to finish. Uh, I would imagine now uh, check it out. Uh, you know, uh, where music is sold online, I suppose, or on your favorite streaming service, uh, and, and definitely support Sonny because she is a phenomenal talent and an amazing artist. Thanks so much, Scott. You take care. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.